Hello, everybody. This is Amanda Grace. I'm back for part two tonight of Moses leading up to Passover and the burning bush and the entire understory about the burning bush, why God sought to kill Moses and the conflict going on within Moses, why the burning bush is so significant and so on. When we left uh, just a few minutes ago. And hello to all our moderators who are back on. God bless everybody who is jumping on. Last we left it, we have realized now that the burning bush, why did God do such a miracle? Because the burning bush represented the Jewish people. They've been on fire for 400 years. They've been enslaved by Egypt, but never consumed. They never fell. They never vanished. They had been thriving under enslavement still for 400 years. They were the burning bush. And that's where God calls Moses to lead a people that are on fire out of Egypt. And then we move to that the Lord told Moses to return to Egypt because those who sought his life are dead. And the Lord tells Moses to issue a direct death threat to Pharaoh that if he doesn't let his people go, he's going to kill his firstborn. So this is a direct intentional death threat on the part of God. Now, who else issued a verbal death threat to Moses? Pharaoh. Pharaoh issues a same similar threat to Moses. Exodus 2, 14 through 15. Then he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So God's trying to kill Moses. When he goes to the inn and first Pharaoh tries to kill Moses and they mirror each other. Pharaoh is the king of Egypt. God is the king of kings in the whole world. The king wants to kill Moses. Maybe God wants to kill Moses for very similar reasons that Pharaoh does. Pharaoh wants to kill Moses. Why? Well, to figure this out first, what happens? Moses goes out sees an Egyptian beating a Jew. And what does he do? He kills the Egyptian. The next day, Moses sees two Jewish men fighting. And what happens? Does Moses kill one of the Jews? No. Moses says, why are you striking your brother? And one of the Jews gets mad and says, who made you judge over us? Are you going to kill me the way you killed that Egyptian? Very different reactions on the part of Moses. Exodus 2.14 contains an answer to this. Then he said, who made you prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. What does this mean? The thing is known. It's the last thing that happened with two Hebrew slaves fighting and Moses intervenes and Pharaoh cares very much about Moses intervening with a fight between two Jews. Why? The answer to this question will help us resolve this issue of why God wanted to kill Moses. Two kings want to kill Moses. The reason the heavenly king wants to kill him is tied up in the reason the earthly king wants to kill him. How could that be? Well, why does Pharaoh want to kill him for a fight having to do with two Jews? Well, there are two objections in Exodus chapter 2, verse 14. Who made you a prince and a judge over us, one? And two, do you intend to kill me as you killed that Egyptian? So Moses basically has no standing to get involved in such a case because he is not Pharaoh. And the threatening to kill is viewed as an unjust reaction. 
what Moses did killing the Egyptian is vigilante justice. It is going rogue. It's not adhering to the laws of Egypt on these matters. It's taking matters into his own hands, which is bypassing Pharaoh. Even when it came to Hebrew slaves, Pharaoh could not have that lawlessness going on and Moses just intervening and doing whatever he wants. What this does is completely displaces and challenges the king's legitimate role as ruler and judge over his people. Moses is usurping the throne itself. So let us go to the other side of this chiasm. Chiasm, it is a literary device where it's like they mirror each other, leading to a middle. Okay, so the last mirror is the first, the second to last mirror is the second to last, and so on towards the middle. So let us go to the other side of the chiasm. Why did God seek to kill Moses? Perhaps for similar reasons that Pharaoh did. There was a verbal death threat with the two Jews arguing. And on the flip side of this, God tells Moses to issue a verbal death threat to Pharaoh that if he did not let his child go, God would kill Egypt's firstborn. As Moses was accused of an unjust reaction by two Hebrews, now he stands accused before the heavenly throne by God himself of similar. What was this? Moses at the burning bush was playing vigilante judge between a fight between two nations, God's firstborn, the Jewish nation, and Egypt. So the God who issues the death threat to Pharaoh goes and accuses Moses of doing something very wrong, is what the chiasm suggests. How could these two things be true at the same time? A, God dispatches Moses to issue this death threat to Pharaoh. B, how could God accuse Moses of having no standing to make this very death threat he tells Moses to make against Pharaoh? Going back to Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 through 26 says, So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son, which was Gershom, and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. The Lord lets Moses go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So Moses has refused towards the end of the burning bush episode to go back to Egypt and threaten Pharaoh. He's like, just find somebody else. I can't do it. This is what he's doing. Exodus 4.13 is different than the other excuses he gives because he flat out tells God to go find someone else, what I just said. The other excuses are, I can't speak right. What do I say to them? What if they don't believe me? Exodus 4.13 is very different. Just go find somebody else. Why? Why is Moses telling the God of the universe, go find someone else? There is an underlying unspoken issue here. God becomes angry with Moses. Don't let his soothing tone fool you about Aaron because he's infuriated with Moses. Exodus 4.14. 4, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Why does Moses seemingly concede to this and begins to journey to Egypt? Because he will not be the one directly issuing this verbal threat to Pharaoh. Aaron will. Why does this make Moses feel better that he's called God is calling Aaron his brother and that Aaron is going to really speak and issue the verbal threat? Um, as well, 
the Aaron will be happy in his heart. That was not totally true, what God said. Meaning the Lord said Aaron was already setting out to meet Moses that day. However, it wasn't until after this incident at the inn of God trying to kill Moses that the next day, Exodus chapter 4, verse 27, then the Lord tells Aaron in a direct order to go out and meet Moses. So when God tells Moses, oh, he's already coming out to meet you, he wasn't. God ordered Aaron the next day to go out and meet his brother who he's never met. So it must be very important for Moses to think that Aaron is setting out to greet him and will be happy to see him. That was the turning point with Moses where he agrees to go. So God's doing something here. He's telling Moses something that he knows will be true, but isn't true at the moment because he's God and he could see a full block of time. Exodus 4.18, so Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. Now, God just told Moses that he's alive. But Moses is like, well, let me go so I can see. Now, even with the brother connection with Aaron, there is still something holding Moses back from going. There's still a hesitancy. How do we know? Exodus 4.18, Jethro says to Moses, go in peace. However, in Exodus 4.19, God has to give Moses a direct order because he's still hesitant to go. He says, now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go, return to Egypt for all the men who sought your life are dead. So Jethro tells him to go and he doesn't go. And God's now got to tell him to go. And he does. What is holding Moses back literally? What is holding him back here? Back to Exodus 2, <clears throat> verses 23 through 24. Now, it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. This is important. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out and their cry came up to God because of the bondages. So God heard their groanings and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. The trigger were the people's cries that compels God to save his firstborn. They are crying out because the, uh, they stopped their work for a moment because the king of Egypt died and there was mourning in the land. This right here is the key as to why Moses does not want to go to Egypt. God, no, now how could this be? You're thinking, what is the Pharaoh dying have to do with Moses? Not with, the Pharaoh wanted to kill him is dead. Why is he so hesitant? God knows what's in Moses' heart and is why he becomes angry in Exodus 4.14 and makes a statement about Aaron, the Levi, being Moses' brother, it, it's already understood Aaron is a Levi, but God points this out. God is modifying this sentence by saying, Aaron the Levi, your brother. Why is he putting an emphasis on this? Well, put yourself in Moses' shoes. Where did Moses grow up? Egypt mothered by Pharaoh's daughter. Lord, please send in your holy warring angels now to chase those coyotes off out of the field. I can hear them. And now Chris just went outside. So Moses grows up in Egypt. He's chasing them off. They stopped. Let me tell you something, guys. We have not had coyotes around here in a very long time. The fact this happened in the middle of this teaching is no accident. The enemy is not happy because we're approaching Passover. And this teaching is very important to understand Passover. 
So just to show you how the enemy operates, no accident. They showed up in the middle of this. Thank you, Lord. Uh, under the spirit of the Lord, Chris went out and chased them off. So put yourself in Moses' shoes. Where did Moses grow up? Egypt. Who was he mothered by? Pharaoh's daughter. He never met Aaron. He never met Miriam until he goes back to Egypt because he was raised by the Egyptians. And then he runs away. Moses grows up as an Egyptian prince. So who are his brothers? The princes of Egypt that were born of Pharaoh's daughter and other children. Even though it is clear from Exodus 2, 11, that someone has told Moses he was born a Hebrew because he knows he is. It mentions Moses going out to his brothers and seeing their suffering. Most likely Pharaoh's daughter has told Moses this when he grew up and he went out and he starts to see the other people now, the Jews as his brothers. So the identity crisis ensues. It ensues. He's raised Egyptian. He's now been told he's Jewish. Now he has a longing for the suffering of his brothers. And that's when he kills the Egyptian. That was severely beating that Jewish man. So back to Moses' hesitancy to go now. The identity crisis comes into this. So when Moses flees in Exodus 2, 21, that is why he is so content to dwell with Jethro or Yithro because he doesn't label Moses as a Hebrew or as an Egyptian. He accepts him for him. So Moses, going through this identity crisis, is thrilled to find somebody that doesn't care if he's Egyptian or Jewish, that just accepts him for him. Exodus 2, 21 through 22, then Moses was content to live with the man and he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses and she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Moses names his, his child. He names his child. Gershom. Why? Because in a way, Moses is longing for Egypt. Egypt is home to Moses. Right after this, the king of Egypt dies, triggering a, a monumental change. He dies. The people stop their work. The Jews, they cry out to God. God is compelled to act, thus the burning bush in Moses. He's got to call Moses now. Why does he have to call Moses? He's been chosen by God, Moses, to help save the Jews in a foreign land. But he, Moses thinks that foreign land of Egypt is his home. The Pharaoh dies. A new Pharaoh arises. Moses' hesitancy has to do with this new Pharaoh, because Moses sees Egypt as home, which means the new Pharaoh is his brother, whom he grew up with. And thus the reason Moses is not telling the Lord, but the Lord already knows that Moses does not want to go to Egypt because he has to oppose his brother because he identifies with Egypt as home and the princes he grew up with are his brothers. And that's why the Lord tells Moses, Aaron, the Levi, your brother, he's saying the Egyptians are your brothers. Aaron is. He's of Jewish descent. He is your blood brother. This is who you should identify with. This is your true brother. God's making a point here. So the Lord tells Moses, your brother is coming out to greet you. So this identity crisis in Moses begins to be resolved. The Lord is making a new brotherly connection to draw Moses to go to Egypt, but to not see Egypt anymore as his people or his home. However, Moses reluctantly goes. He is the man with no country and identity. 
He's got an identity crisis, which is ensued within him. And as Moses reluctantly goes after the Lord said, Aaron, your brother, he reluctantly goes. He does not circumcise his youngest son, Gershom, the son whose name means stranger in a foreign land, the son whom he named because he longs for Egypt. This is very significant. Why did Moses? You see, what happened was God took Moses out of Egypt, but Egypt never came out of Moses. And we see hints of it in the naming of his son and things he says. Why did Moses not circumcise his son? Well, this makes Moses vulnerable to God. And to understand why God was going to kill Moses, we need to look again at Pharaoh and why he wanted to kill Moses. Moses, in the case of killing the Egyptian and intervening in the fight between the two Jews, was vigilante justice. Taking matters into his own hands and not having the authority to judge like Pharaoh would judge. He was trying to act as a Pharaoh that he wasn't. He was usurping the throne of Pharaoh and his authority. Now, God, in this equation, is our father and our king. The way you relate to a king is not the way you relate to a father. A father you live with or you grow up with or you know in a different way of a king who is meant to be a ruler and a judge. A father will do anything to save his child. A king is the judge and the jury. Objective, that's a king, a good king. However, God is both. He's the father, the king, the judge. He wants Egypt to know he is king and he is father of the Jews at the same time. In the account of Passover, the Lord will not let them be consumed with signs and wonders. If he has to do it, he will do whatever it takes to free his firstborn child. God will break all the rules because he is subjective as a father. This is his firstborn child. He wants to save them. He wants them back. So God, the father, threatens to kill the firstborn of Egypt. God, the king, may have objected as it's not just to kill millions of firstborn, but God, the father, says, I do not care. I want my child. He will break all the rules of nature. He will do miracles. He will turn water to blood. He will bring darkness. He will even take their firstborn because he wants his child back. This is vigilante justice. And who gets to exercise that? Enter Moses. Only a brother can do this and go and tell Pharaoh to let the Lord's people go or else he'll kill their firstborn. Who can say that? Only someone who is part of the Jewish nation, who is all in, who is a brother. Moses cannot be God's agent unless he is all in with the Jewish nation. When God went to kill Moses. He was saying, this is a family thing. This is a family issue. Only family can execute this kind of vigilante justice. And you are still torn between Egypt and the Jews for you have not circumcised your youngest son. You have not circumcised your youngest son who you named because you long for Egypt. So when this happens, Moses' wife, who's a smart cookie, by the way, realizes why God wants to kill Moses. Because Moses is still vacillating between two nations and he can't go before Pharaoh and threaten to kill the firstborn, being God's agent, when he is still partially longing for Egypt because the son he named after longing for Egypt, he has refused to circumcise. He's hesitated. So Zipporah, realizing this, makes the decision for Moses. And she circumcises their youngest son, Gershom, right there 
the severing Moses' last tie to Egypt and thus making him family to the Jews, fully circumcised. Therefore, God relents. And Moses from that day forward was all in, making the Jewish nation his family and severing ties with Egypt. The cutting and the circumcision was a physical and spiritual representation of the tie that was severed between Moses and Egypt right there. The last tie, the last thing that ties into longing for Egypt gets severed. And with that, Moses is completely severed from Egypt and Egypt comes out of Moses. And Moses then goes on from that point forward. It's no longer about Moses. It's about us. Him and Aaron, the Jewish people going up before Pharaoh, who once was his brother, but he's now been circumcised from Egypt through the circumcision of his son Gershom, who's named stranger in a foreign land. That's what his name means. And therefore, Moses can now be the agent of God and go up against his former brother, who he has been severed from and joined by blood to the Jews. And God relents. And Moses goes on to be one of the greatest leaders in Jewish history and one of the greatest leaders ever in the word of God. After that incident, Moses was all in because he saw God was serious and God wasn't playing around. And Moses had vacillated long enough. And that's where his helpmate, his wife, was so important. Seeing what was going on, seeing the struggle with Moses, seeing the identity crisis, seeing the name of her youngest son. And making the decision right there to sever him from Egypt. So when he went back, he wouldn't be wooed back in to Egypt. And thus, that is the backstory of Moses' journey leading up to him going before Pharaoh. That's the backstory that gets completely overlooked because everyone wants to jump right to the showdown with Moses and Pharaoh. They talk about the burning bush and then they jump. But there is so much there in the scriptures when you begin to take it apart and you begin to dissect it and you begin to understand through teachings and rabbis what's in the scriptures. Everything is woven together. It's amazing in the word of God how it's all woven together. And so thus this teaching is supposed to do that and get you ready for Passover and show you that even Moses himself went through an internal struggle where he was hesitant to do what God asked him to do because he still had ties to something that should have died in his life a long time ago. It should have passed away. That tie to Egypt, that longing for Egypt should have passed away. And many times we're in Moses' position where there's something that should have gone, should have been severed, should have been circumcised from us. And now we're vacillating in what God wants us to do. And once you fully commit and surrender, because that's what Moses did in Zipporah, you see God do the most incredible things in your life. So if you think Moses didn't struggle with this decision, he did. But he turned out to be one of the greatest leaders ever for the Lord. So all glory be to God. That is the end of part two of Moses and his story leading up to Pesach, Passover and the burning bush. I thoroughly hope that you enjoyed this teaching. It ties a lot to things going on in our nation. Even right now, it ties a lot to us as a, as a people in this nation, that the children of God crying out to God right now, God, because of the covenant, will act. It's just a matter of his timing. So we thank you. We give all glory to God. We pray this really ministered to you. And 
If you go on Amanda Grace, the number four him.blogspot.com, this teaching will be up as well as the shopping list and preparation instructions for Passover, which we will be having this Saturday, March 27th. Chris, if you're watching and you want to come in for a moment as we close, God bless Chris for chasing those coyotes away. But see, the enemy is not happy right now. He's not. And this happens leading up to Passover. And we praise the Lord that he broke Egypt, made a spectacle of the principalities over Egypt and delivered his people. You're going to pray? Close us in prayer. Uh, you would say. Yep. So if you go on the blog, you can get everything you need for Passover. We'll begin about 7, 7, 15 p.m. this Saturday night, March 27th. And we're going to go through all of Passover with you. And so this is going to be a time of just glorifying God and celebration for what he did for our Jewish brothers and sisters, bringing them out of Egypt with signs and wonders. We praise the Lord. And here's Chris. Let me see Chris right. here. Would you like to pray? You and me. Yes, I'm going to hold your hand and you're going to pray. And close us out in prayer. Okay. You want to grab that here? Okay. Jesus, O oh Lord, I owe you, Lord, and mand us so, and you to go to all your father for your for there I go there. I know, Lord, you are not nigh. You go by, you go body, you go to body, you go to the body, you go to Oh, let go down, down, why are they what they are? They go down, what they go down, what they go down. They go down, they go down, they go down, they go down, they go down. They go down, 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 they go down. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. They go down, they go down. And no one ever down, they go down. Jesus. Amen, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for this time. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Do your name. We praise you for the time upcoming of Passover, Lord. And we praise you that you are a mighty God. You mm -hmm. are mighty to save, and you do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. Yes. In precious name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen and amen. 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 Thank you to everybody. Thank you to our moderators as well, who... Um, are so good with the chat and we just we're just very grateful for you and everybody that helps with Ark of Grace Ministries have a wonderful rest of your evening and this Thursday we are premiering at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time window into the supernatural with uh brother Dave Scarlett, Mr. Jim Stockstill and myself our first guest is Mr. John Redenbow, who has been given an incredible gift from the Lord in dream interpretation. We're going to get him on Ark of Grace Ministries too. There's a lot of misconceptions about dreams as well, and he's going to be there to clear them up, back it up with scripture, and discuss um, dream interpretation from the Lord and why the Lord gives us dreams in the first place. So that's this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Friday 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Standard Time is Grace and Glory. Looking forward to that. And then Saturday will be our Passover celebration. So looking forward to seeing all of you. Yes. Praise the Lord. My voice kind of held up. Thank you. God bless you all. Yes. Keep the faith. Um, we love you. And one more announcement. I have a board here that's like a cork board. When you mail us. If you'd like to send pictures, why we are, would like to assemble on the cork board pictures of those of us who watch. So at the bottom of the description is our PO box. We want to put up a cork board that has pictures of everybody who watches, the extended family that watches at Ark of Grace Ministries. So if any of you want to participate in that, please just mail us a picture, photo of you, your pets, your family. Grace agrees.
And we think it'll be a wonderful, wonderful addition. And we'll put it up in the office. So God bless everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. To God be all the glory. Good night.